All right, good morning once again. Uh, if you'd open your Bible to the book of 1 Samuel, uh, chapter 25. <clears throat> this morning we're going to be in verses 2 to 22. 1 Samuel 25, 2 to 22. The title of the sermon this morning is Abigail, Discerning and Beautiful. And uh, let me once again say to all of our uh, mothers in the house, uh, expectant mothers, spiritual mothers, happy Mother's Day. Uh, if you are wondering, uh, was this sermon chose because it's Mother's Day? It wasn't. Uh, so I just want to make set expectations that at the end of the sermon. You're like, that was, that was not a Mother's Day sermon. Uh, I, I did not choose this. Uh, uh, it just happens to be about Abigail, who's not, uh, uh, the text is not about her being a mom, but I could see how you might make that connection with it being about a female this morning and thinking that. Uh, so just, that's where we're at. We've been going through First Samuel uh, for quite some time now. And uh, we've made it to chapter 25. We're almost done uh, with the book. And uh, after that, we will be back in the New Testament, most likely in 1 Peter, though that might change. Um, and so uh, two things that will be different about the sermon this morning. Normally, I read all the text up front. I won't be doing that this morning because we're in a long text this morning. Uh, and I'll read it as I go through it. And then also, normally, I give exposition up front and then application after that. I won't be doing that this morning. I'll be weaving those together because, again, it's a long text so um, you'll just have to have a discerning ear to uh, hear the application this morning. So uh, if you will, open in a word of pr uh, prayer with me, and, um, and then we'll jump into the sermon this morning. Lord, uh, we thank you for the, the men and women um, of the faith. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us these examples that we can grow from and learn from. We thank you for David and his faithfulness, Lord, that we see such an imperfect man, an imperfect king, but a man who was after your heart, who strived after your heart and to strive to have your heart. And we thank you for Abigail, Lord, um, and for her example of discernment and generosity, um, and just the way that her wisdom, Lord, that she uh, was able to avert a disaster. And Lord, I pray that all of us, uh, both men and women here this morning, would, would learn from her story, uh, learn from her example over the next two weeks, this week and next week, Lord. Um, God, we thank you for uh, the faithful women who have gone before us, God, that all of us can learn from and all of us can, can see the giftings and the, the way that you have shaped them and fashioned them, uh, that we would learn from their example. So God, teach us this morning as, as um, we sang, Lord, teach us, um, God, through your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, first Samuel 25, uh, we left off in verse 1 last week. So let's start off with our text beginning in verse, uh, I'm going to read verse 1, but then we'll go from verse 1 all the way to 3. So if you will... Uh, follow along in your copy of God's Word, 1 Samuel 25, beginning verse 1. Now Samuel died, and all Israel assembled and mourned for him, and they buried him in his house at Ramah. Then David rose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. And there was a man in Maon whose business was in Carmel. The man was very rich. He had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. He was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Now the name of the man was Nabal. And the name of his wife was Abigail. The woman was discerning and beautiful. But the man was harsh and badly behaved. He was a Calebite. We'll stop right there. So as we've been going through this story of David and Saul, we, we kind of get a, a, a reprieve from that, you know. Uh, and we sidestep to another story of David and Abigail, which is kind of a welcome break in the, the saga of David and Saul. After David and Saul part ways, Saul goes back home and David and his men go to the strongholds of En Gedi. But after some time, we don't know how much time, David decides it's time to move on. And so he goes and travels to the wilderness of Paran. Now the Septuagint has wilderness of Maon, probably because Nabal is from there. Which is why if you have NIV and you're reading that, you're wondering, why does it say the desert of Maon? That's why, because the Septuagint translates it that way, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Um, I don't know which is correct, um, 
but maybe I would go with the desert of Maon. So that's where uh, this man is from. And so we're introduced to this man. We learned six things about him here. Uh, let's look at those. Number one, we learned that he's from Maon, but his business is in Carmel, a town of about one mile away. Two, we learned that he's very rich. He has 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. Remember, this is an agrarian society. You think, man, he's love pets. No, he, this is an agrarian society. This is an agrarian barter society. They would trade. This is like currency. This is like having a lot of Teslas or something, right? Uh, th- and so he's very rich. Three, his name is Nabal. I'll talk about that next week. Four, he's married and his wife's name is Abigail. Five, he's described as being harsh and badly behaved. What does that mean? Uh, harsh means stubborn or stiff-necked or rough or stern. And badly behaved, literally, he was evil in his deeds. And number six, he is a Calebite. What is that? Why, does it, why do they give that detail? The Hebrew translates literally like his heart. That's how the Hebrew literally reads, like his heart. And you're like, well, why does it translate Calebite? There seems to be a pun here that is probably difficult for us to understand. It either means one of these two. It either means like a dog, because Caleb sounds like the Hebrew word for dog. Or it means like his heart, that he is like his heart. And what's his heart like? Harsh and evil. I think there's a Hebrew pun here. It's hard to recreate that in English. So this is not a very good picture of Nabal. Nabal is the quintessential example of Jesus' statement What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and to forfeit his soul? Nabal has it all. He has a thriving business. He's sheep shearer. He's very rich. He's got many animals. And he has a beautiful wife. Business, rich, Beautiful wife. He's got everything that a man could want except the one thing that matters most, his soul. Now contrast Nabal with his wife. The narrator intends for us to see a sharp contrast between this husband and this wife. Now we learn three things about her. Number one, her name is Abigail. What does that mean? It means my father is joy or it means the joy of my father. It's a good Any other future daughters born in the church? Abigail is a good one. Maybe what, probably what we would have named our daughter uh, if we had one. Two, uh, discerning. What does that mean? It's two words in the Hebrew here. The first is good. The second is a broad term that can mean wise, clever, intelligent, or understanding. Now, Proverbs talks about this term. It's often translated good sense in Proverbs. Same, same, same two words. Here's some uh, times it's mentioned in Proverbs. Good sense is commended by men, Proverbs 12, 8. Good sense wins favor, 13, 15. Good sense is a fountain of life. Good sense makes one slow to anger, Proverbs 19, 11. And so we're going to see in Abigail's life that this discernment that she has, this good sense, not only protects her entire household, but it also protects David. And protects his walk with God. And number three, we learn that she's beautiful. There's two words used there in the Hebrew. The first word is a typical word for beautiful. The second is the word for appearance or form. Meaning that she was either beautiful in appearance or beautiful in form or both. Now, you might say, why does the narrator mention this? Abigail actually joins a long list of men and women in scripture who are described as beautiful. Sarah, Rachel, Joseph, David, two different Tamars, Absalom, Abishag, Esther, and Job's daughters. All of them are described with the same word as beautiful. We might say, why does the Bible take the time to describe over a dozen people who are physically beautiful? Why do they mention this? I thought charm is deceitful and beauty is vain. Proverbs 31, 30. It is. That's true. But consider this. When the Bible says that God knit us together in our mother's womb, 
Do you ever consider that also includes Jesus and Mary's womb? God, the Father, knit Jesus together in Mary's womb. God could have knit Jesus together in such a way that he would have been the most handsome man you have ever seen. He could have done that. He did it for Tom Brady. He could do it for Jesus. But he chose not to. He knit Jesus together in such a way that he had no form, no majesty, no beauty that we should desire him, Isaiah 53. So then the question becomes, why does the Bible mention over a dozen characters who are described as beautiful? And here's my best guess at this. Because all beauty, all beauty, whether in nature or in people, is always a reflection, a pointing to the beauty of our God. Every time you see a beautiful scene in nature, or if you see a beautiful man or woman, it is always a reflection of the beauty of our God. When I think about Abigail, there are many things that we can pursue in this life. There are many things that we do sometimes pursue, right? There are many things, intelligence, skill, talent, creativity, popularity, relativity, coolness, beauty, productivity, competency, humor, likability. It's not that any of those are necessarily wrong, but may I humbly challenge all of us, including myself, seek to be a wise woman. Seek to be a wise man. What saves Abigail's family in this story, what saves David's righteousness in this story, it's not her beauty. It's not her riches. It's not even her marital status. What saves her and saves David is her discernment, her wisdom. Seek to be men and women who are wise, who are discerning. There are many things you could pursue that would not be a fool's errand. Look at verse four to eight. David heard in the wilderness that the ball was shearing his sheep. So David sent 10 young men and David said to the young men, go up to Carmel and go to Nabal and greet him in my name. And thus you shall greet him. Peace be to you and peace be to your house and peace be to all that you have. I hear that you have shearers. Now your shepherds have been with us and we did them no harm and they missed nothing all the time that they were in Carmel. Ask your young men and they will tell you. Therefore, let my young men find favor in your eyes, for we come on a feast day. Please give whatever you have at hand to your servants and to your son, David. Stop right there. So David gets word that Nabal is in Carmel shearing his sheep. Remember, it's about one mile away from where he lives. He goes there to do his business. He sends 10 of his men on a mission to this town. He tells his 10 men, go to Nabal and pronounce peace to him. Pronounce peace to his house and to all that he has. So David's men are coming with a blessing. They're coming to bless Nabal. And they have a request. But before they make the request, they tell Nabal that all this time that they have been in the wilderness, Nabal's shepherds have been among them. Remember the sheep stay in the wilderness and David's men are around them. And David's men tell Nabal that, look, we have treated your shepherds with integrity. You say, why why do they mention this? Because it was not uncommon in those days that if there was a small army like this, like 600 men, what would they do? They would just take what they wanted by force. These are shepherds with a staff. They might have had a weapon, but this is David's army of 600 men. They have to eat. And if you haven't eaten in like a week and you see a nice sheep or a goat, I mean, I don't know if they... It'd be tempting to just go take it. I got to eat. 
And the shepherds really couldn't do anything about it. And so David is assuring the ball. He says, listen, the whole time we have not done this. We never took anything that wasn't ours. We have treated your shepherds with integrity. He says, look, if you, don't, if you, want, to make, if you want to verify, go ask your shepherds. They'll verify this. Go investigate. They'll verify that we've been honest and, 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 and integrous with you this whole time. In light of this, David makes a request. He says, look, please give whatever you have on hand to your servants. To your son, David, metaphorically speaking. He says, we come on a feast day, meaning they're already making food and provisions. So in other words, you think like, we well, got 600 men. How are you going to feed 600 men? It's a feast day. So they're already preparing all the provisions and all the stuff. So he says, look, we come on a feast day. We didn't want this to be a burden to you. We came on a day that you were, it's like, it's like 4th of July barbecue. You know how 4th of July barbecue, we always have like so much food left over. And it's like, imagine if like, you know, a couple guys who were really hungry came up to us and said, could they have some food? And we were like, no, go get your own watermelon. He says, we came on a feast day. Now this is an interesting scene because here is the future king of the land who is asking for some help. Remember, Nabal is very rich. He has food and provisions to spare. Let's see what Nabal's response is. Look at verse 9 to 11. When David's young men came, they said all this to Nabal in the name of David, and, and then they waited. And Nabal answered David's servants, Who is David? Who is the son of Jesse? There are many servants these days who are breaking away from their masters. Shall I take my bread and my water and my meat that I have killed for my shears and give it to the men who come from where I don't know where? David said, Nabal says, who is David? Who is the son of Jesse? That's ironic. He's only the future king. He's only the future king. This is like the scene in Beauty and the Beast, where, you know, where the prince rebuffs the old haggard woman at the door, not knowing that she's a beautiful enchantress. Nabal's response reminds us of what Jesus said. Remember Jesus said, for I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. Truly I say to you, as you did it, you did not do it to one of the least of these. You did not do it to me. Now what is Nabal's reasoning here? Why is Nabal doing this? He says, there are many servants these days that are breaking away from their masters. No, I assume that's true. I don't think the statement's not true. I think it's true. Remember, remember the people who joined David, his army? Where are many of these men from? They're people in debt. Normally in debt means that you got to pay it off. How do you pay it off? You pay it off with work. They don't want to pay it off with work, so they left. So I assume his statement is true. Many of these people did break away from their masters. So we might assume that Nabal's being what? discerning here. Maybe Nabal, Nabal, you know, Nabal's story, he's like, in the story of Nabal, Nabal was discerning and handsome. What is, how do we discern whether Nabal is being discerning or not? This is why discernment and mercy or discernment and kindness are often a very fine line. They're often a very fine line. But I think we're given a clue into Nabal's heart. We are given a clue into what is really going on in his heart. And it occurs with this word that happened, that, that, that the narrator writes four times in verse 11. Did you pick it up in verse 11? What word occurs four times? Somebody shout it out. My or I. My, my bread, my water, my meat, my shears. Not God's, mine. We see that hospitality and generosity start with the premise that none of this is mine. This is not my bread. This is not my water. This is not my meat. These are not my shearers. These are God's. God has given me everything I have. So is David going to respond to Nabal's rebuff? Or is he just going to move on? 
Look at verse 12 to 13. So David's young men turned away and came back and told him all this. And David said to his men, every man strap on his sword. And every man strapped on his sword. David also strapped on his sword. And about 400 men went up after David, while 200 remained with the baggage. Now, you don't see David get angry very often. But he's angry here. Every man strap on his sword. You don't strap on a sword to have a conversation. David takes 400 men with him. You don't take 400 men to have a conversation. 200 men stay behind to guard the weapons and the vessels. Now, is David wrong here? Is David wrong here? Yeah. Yes, he is. His response is understandable, but still wrong. Remember earlier we looked at this phrase, good sense? What did the writer of Proverbs say good sense does? Good sense makes one slow to anger, but it is to his glory to overlook an offense. <clears throat> Overlooking an offense. Is it me or does it feel like in our society this is becoming unheard of? Overlooking offenses? Even in the church. Sometimes in the world, we see that an offense, like here, leads to potential murder. Leads to potential murder or just straight out murder. I saw the other day that a woman shot someone for getting their fast food order wrong. If you look these stories up, especially over the past two to three years, I mean, like the, the, the lockdowns and, the, and everything that's happened over the past, like it's made people crazy. If you look up stories over the past two to three years, you will see that these stories are not anomalies. People get shot for like just, un, like, and, and, and it's like nobody's overlooking any offenses anymore. It's like the theme song for, for all of us is like, we're not going to take it anymore. Now, in the church, that doesn't happen too often, though. I did see a pastor, someone tried to shoot a pastor the other day, and it made me, like, was like, you know, like. In the church, we get offended. And we don't go and murder each other. What do we do? We cut people off. He's not going to talk to you anymore. Harbor grudges. Gossip and slander. We start ministerial battles. Or you leave the church. I'll just leave. Brothers and sisters, it is to our glory to overlook an offense. Verses 14 to 17. But one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, Behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to greet our master, and he railed at them. Yet the men were very good to us, and we suffered no harm. And we did not miss anything when we were in the fields as long as we went with them. They were a wall to us both by night and by day, all the while we were with them keeping the sheep. Now, therefore, know this and consider what you should do, for harm is determined against our master and against all his house, and he is such a worthless man that no one can speak to him. <clears throat> now, it appears that Abigail is not the only one who is discerning. One of Nabal's young men is also discerning. He is wise enough to go and tell Abigail all that what happened. He says, look, David sent messengers to greet our master, literally to bless our master. The word there is bless. But what did Nabal do? Nabal railed at them. We don't use that word that much anymore, railed at them. What does that mean? Other translations of this are scorned, hurled insults, screamed, shouted, or reviled. Nabal is living up to his description of being harsh and evil. 
And this young man testifies to Abigail that says, look, what David said is true. They were good to us. We suffered no harm from them. We did not miss anything, meaning they never stole from us. They never took anything that was ours. And notice he says that he adds one more piece. They were even a wall to us. What does that mean, a wall to us? Meaning David's 600 men acted as a defensive wall to the shepherds, probably fending off attacks from wolves, lions, bears, right? I don't think a wolf or a lion is going to think twice about attacking if you've got 600 men with spears and, and, and swords. And, and also if any small band of raiders, you know, it was, it, was, it was not uncommon in those days that you'd have little small bands of plunderers who would, 30 men, 20 men, 15 men, they would just, they were nomads, they would go wherever they wanted, and then whenever they'd come across a, a, a sheep pen, they would just take what they wanted, that was not uncommon. And so this servant is saying, look, these 600 men were a wall. I thought about, I don't have this in the sermon, but I thought about this, that whatever Nabal would have lost by being generous with David and his men, let's say that he loses like 0.1% of his total net worth. That's probably all it would have been. David's men probably like saved him like 5% of his net worth. Like David's men protected and provided more for him than whatever God was asking or David was asking him to give up. And so it's, it's not as though David is looking for a handout. David and his men were like free protection for Nabal's assets. That's what makes, you know, that would be like if somebody, if like two police officers came to us and said, hey, we'll stand out here and we'll guard your church. And then like after like in the middle of the service, they come and they walk back to Jason, who's back there as the usher and says, hey, can I get some water? And Jason's like, no. That's what it would, I mean, like that, that's seriously what, it, what this is like. Nabal is like the servant who is forgiven 10,000 talents, but he won't forgive 100 denarii. So this young man tells Abigail, you need to know all of this. You need to consider what you should do. Wait, why Abigail? Wait, why, why does Abigail need to consider what she should do? Why is this young man telling Abigail? Why is he not telling Nabal? Because he is a worthless man. Man. You ever want to insult somebody? Like, like, that's like the ultimate insult, isn't it? Uh, you're worthless. Oh boy. Literally, maybe the Hebrew is a little bit even worse. Son of Belial. He is a son of Belial. This is the same term that's used to describe people enticing others to idolatry in Deuteronomy 13. It's the same term in Judges 19. Remember the man who gathered outside the Levite's home with the concubine? They wanted to have relations with the men, and then they ended up having relations with the Levite. Those men, sons of Belial. It's also used of Eli's sons. Remember H uh, Hophni and Phinehas? Sons of Belial. Sheba, 2 Samuel 20, led a revolt against David, son of Belial. The two men who falsely accused Naboth. Remember, Jezebel has two men that she uses to accuse Naboth of, of idolatry, and, 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 and then Naboth gets killed for it. Those two men, sons of Belial. Rehoboam. Remember Rehoboam had wise counselors and then had young friends. The wise ones told him to do this. His young friends told him to do this. Those counselors, sons of Belial. This is not a good list to be included in. Now, none of us who are in Christ are worthless men and women. None of us are sons of Belial. We are sons of God. So I don't want to, I'm not going to give any application on that part. Because if you're in Christ, you're not a son. You're never a son of Belial. You're always a son of God. But the second phrase I do want us to consider. Because no one can speak to him. What does that mean? Well, it means he's stubborn. The servant realized that even though his testimony is true, it would fall on deaf ears. Meaning, even if I told Nabal all of this, Nabal would just dismiss it. Why? Because he's stubborn. 
Now, that should cause all of us to pause and to ask ourselves, am I somebody that listens? Am I somebody that not only listens, but when I listen, do I consider, do I weigh, do I test, do I struggle, do I contemplate? Proverbs says that the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. Now you might say, how do I become a wise man? How do I become a wise woman? Proverbs also says, listen to advice and accept instruction that you may gain wisdom in the future. So there's a catch 22 here. The wise man listens to advice. Those who listen to advice become wise. And on and on. You want to be wise? Listen to counsel. Are you wise? Do you listen to counsel? Doesn't mean you always follow it, right? There's a lot of bad counsel out there, guys. But at least means you listen to it, you weigh it, you test it, you contemplate over it, you struggle with it. I say this to you because, guys, sometimes, you know, I, I, I'll see someone give you counsel. I'll be like in a worshiping community group or a breakout session, and I'll see one of you give someone else counsel. And I, can, I, I know you guys. I see you, and I'm like, that, that went in one ear and out the other. It, it's very obvious. Early in my marriage... I used to think that what it meant to be a leader, what it meant to be the head, was that I needed to have all the answers. I need to have all the answers so that, you know, if my wife asks me something, I'm like, I have an answer to it. That's not what it means. You know what it means? It means listening to all the advice. Listening to all the counsel. And then consider it, weigh it, and submit it to the Lord. Look at verse 18. Then Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves and two skins of wine and five sheep already prepared and five sayas of parched grain and 100 clusters of raisins and 200 cakes of figs and laid them on donkeys. Wow. Man. Abigail springs to action. It says, Abigail made haste. We see that Abigail, she's not only discerning and beautiful, but she is proactive. She takes action. I think one of the greatest misconceptions about complementarianism, if you don't know what complementarianism is, come see me afterward because I cannot explain it in the sermon. I think one of the greatest misconceptions about complementarianism is that women are just in the back seat. They don't have a role to play. Their gifting is not needed. Their gifting is not useful. That's a complete misrepresentation of what complementarianism is and what it teaches and what it upholds. It's a complete misrepresentation. Listen to Proverbs 31. I'm going to read it. Listen to Proverbs 31 that describes an excellent wife, but everything I've included also would apply to single women. This is true for all you women. Who is an excellent woman? She seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She is like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from afar. She rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. She dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hands to the distaff and her hands hold the spindle. She opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. She makes bed coverings for herself. She makes linen garments and sells them. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Now, Abigail is such a woman. She is wise 
but she is not pompous. She is beautiful, but she is not self-centered. She proactively makes haste to be generous. She takes 200 loaves, two skins of wine, five sheep already prepared, five says of parched grain, that's about 50 quarts, a hundred clusters of raisins, and 200 cakes of figs. Now, if you notice, David said, just give us whatever you have on hand. Meaning, look, if you've got moldy, crummy bread, just give us that. But Abigail brings a feast. You know, we, we, we watch the show Survivor. Um, and in that show, you know, like for 40 days, they're living off of rice and coconut. Like, that's it. And so whenever they have these, they have these challenges and whoever wins the challenge gets a reward. And the reward is like food. Like real, like real food. And so when they win, it's a big deal. I mean, they're going like berserk, right? Last night it was uh, chicken kebabs. Why? Because they need calories. They need energy. And I'm sure the same is true. These 600 men are living in the, the desert. It's not like there's a Safeway down the street. They need calories. They need food. They need energy. And Abigail comes preparing bread and wine and meat and grain and even dessert, raisins and figs. We see that Abigail is not only discerning and beautiful and proactive, she's also generous. She is a picture of our Savior who when the people were hungry, when the 5,000 were hungry, He not only fed them, but he fed them until they were satisfied. They couldn't eat anymore. They had 12 basketfuls left over. When the wedding guests were thirsty, not only did he provide wine, he provided the choice wine. Abigail is a picture of our Savior who provides and provides. Look at verse 19 to 20. And she said to her young men, go on before me. Behold, I come after you. But she did not tell her husband Nabal. And as she rode on the donkey and came under the cover of the mountain, behold, David and his men came down toward her and she met them. Stop right there. Abigail says to her young men, you go on before me and I will come after you. Now, why does she do this? I don't know. And all, I read six commentaries trying to find an opinion on this, and I couldn't find a single opinion on this. I don't know why she tells them to go on ahead. I assume is that it's a cultural decision of respect, that in their culture it would have been more respectful to have the young men go on first, and then she would come behind them. One thing the narrator does tell us is that Abigail does not tell her husband Nabal that she's doing this. Now, wives, you've never not told your husband something, right? That's a significant detail. We may not be able to feel the full force of this today. But we must consider the cultural and historical context here. Historically, this is 3,000 years ago. And culturally, it's a patriarchal society. Women did not act independently in those days from their parents or their husbands. They just didn't. It was unheard of. I mean, it would be like if one of our sons one day decided that he wanted like a ring pop. And so he just like started walking to Safeway and like took some money and also took some money out of my like coin change thing, went and bought a ring pop and came home. And I'm like, where'd you get that ring pop? I went to Safeway and got it. Like, they, they, they know that that's never happened and that never will happen. They, they know not to, this is how it was. I'm not, not, I'm not defending that, okay? I'm, not, I'm, I'm explaining that. I'm not defending that. But in that society, women just did not act independently from their husbands or their parents. They just didn't, ever. So what do we make of this? Was Abigail wrong? It's a tricky one. Was she wrong to not tell her husband? No. No, I don't think so. 
I thought you were complementarian. Another misrepresentation of complementarianism. Another misrepresentation is that complementarianism leads to abuse. It doesn't. It doesn't. That's a misrepresentation of complementarianism. Complementarianism says that a woman should submit to her husband, but she doesn't submit to abuse. She doesn't submit to sin. If a wife has a husband who is engaged in ongoing, unrepentant sin, and I mean this right now to all you wives right now, or women if you're married to a, a man in the future, or a parent if you're under your parents' authority, if a wife has a husband who is engaged in ongoing, unrepentant sin, she should talk to her pastor, or the elders, or whatever leadership is in place in their church. If a wife has a husband who is abusing her or abusing her children in any way, she should talk to her leadership. And she doesn't need her husband's permission to do this. She doesn't. Nabal is described as harsh, evil, worthless, scornful, and stubborn. And his ongoing unrepentant sin, it's not going to just lead to abuse. You know what it's going to lead to? The death of every male in his household. We're going to see that in just a minute. So no, she is not wrong for coming out from under the authority of her husband. No, she's not. Now there's a lot more to say to that. And if you have questions about that, come see me afterward. Abigail sends her men ahead of her and she mounts a donkey and she rides toward David. After some time, she meets with them. But before the narrator describes what this meeting is like, he gives David's state of mind. Let's look at verse 21 to 22. This is the last, of, last section of our passage. Verse 21 to 22. Now David had said, Surely in vain have I guarded all that this fellow has in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that belonged to him, and he has returned me evil for good. God do so to the enemies of David and more also if by morning I leave so much as one male of all who belong to him. Now, I don't have this in the sermon, but I'm just going to make a point about it. When it says one male, why does he say one male? The Hebrew of that is a lot more crass. You can look it up later. Please don't look it up now. You can look it up later, what the Hebrew, how the Hebrew translates that. But what, why does he give that description? What he's basically saying is David <clears throat> is going to kill every single male in this household. N not just Nabal. He's going to kill Nabal, all of Nabal's sons, all the servants, all the servant's sons. He's going to kill even little babies. He's going to kill them all. David is furious. He says, surely in vain I've guarded all this fellow has in the wilderness. Meaning, it was useless. It was for nothing. And notice, David is so angry, like Saul, he doesn't even call him by name. He just says, this fellow. He has returned me evil for good. Now, where have we seen that before? Remember, Saul said, I have returned you evil for good. So David was accustomed to this. Even though Saul returned him evil for good... David showed Saul mercy. Now, will David show mercy to Nabal? Think about it. Saul is trying to kill David. And David shows him mercy. Nabal simply said, no bread for you. All right, you're going to die then. God do so to the enemies of David and more if by this morning I leave. Now, now what's he doing there? He's putting himself under an oath. Now, you have a footnote there. The Net Bible has an interesting, I had it in my sermon. I initially took it out because it's really long. But the Net Bible has an interesting note. Later after the sermon, you can go back and read the Net Bible note. Please, after the sermon. You can read that on your own time. But 
What this is saying is that David calls down an oath upon himself. Now it says here, may God do so to the enemies of David. But I don't think that's the correct translation. That's what the Net Bible note is saying. I think the correct translation is, may God call down, may God do so more to David if I don't do this. Now, who does David sound like here? Saul. Saul. He sounds just like Saul. Remember how Saul put himself under an oath? He said that whoever, or or put his whole army under an oath, he said, whoever has eaten food this day, whoever eats food this day will surely die. And then he finds out that it's his son. His son had some honey. Now Saul was going to fulfill this oath. He was going to kill his own son. But his, his, his men saved him. His men saved Jonathan. So what does this all mean? It means we're given a very small glimpse here of how easily David could have become Saul. I mean, when you, we're stopping at verse 22 here, and I realize this is somewhat like a cliffhanger. Like if this was, if this was a TV show, show this would be the, the season finale of the TV series, David and Saul, season two. And the lingering question is, will David become Saul? Saul went into Nob and he killed every man, woman, child, and infant simply because he was jealous of David. Is David really going to go into Maon, into Nabal's house and kill every man, boy, and infant son? simply because he refused to feed him? Is David going to be Saul 2.0? Or, or, is God going to use a beautiful, discerning, proactive, and generous woman to keep David from becoming Saul? We'll have to wait till next week. Let me close with this. You want to say to David, what what happened, man? David, what happened? I mean, last week, you know, we were reading the story of how you were in the cave and Saul's been trying to kill you. Saul has has killed uh, men and women and children and infants. Saul's Saul's more than worthless. He is just downright evil. And you had him in your hand. You could have killed him. And, and you showed him mercy. What, what, what happened, David? Did your mercy get all used up? Did your mercy get all dried up? Did you spend it all on, on, on Saul? We see once again that David is not perfect. David is not Jesus. He is not the king that we are looking for. How many times have we been Nabal and we rebuffed Jesus in our life? How many times should Jesus have strapped on a sword to come and kill us, but instead he strapped on a cross to come and save us? Even on my worst day, On my worst day, I might be just like Nabal. Rebuffing Jesus. Hey, you want to spend time with me? No, no, this show's really good. And his mercy does not run dry. He never comes bearing a sword. He only comes bearing a cross. A cross is the only thing strapped to his back. 